Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith. Having your Bibles this morning, let's open them, please, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7. And today is part three in our series, Covenant Love. Probably will be the last part. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we'll read beginning with verse number 1. Thank you, Lord. When you have it, say, I have it. Good, good. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him, himself above all people that are upon uh, the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. I love that passage and I love verse 9. Let's read verse 9 one more time. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. We've said in this series that God makes covenant because he loves and I believe that that's, this text is pretty much good proof of that along with other places. His love for us is an everlasting love. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that He will never, ever stop loving you. God will never, ever stop loving you. doesn't matter if you wake up in a bad mood. It doesn't matter if you kick the cat, uh, kick the dog, whatever. You know, however, how, however ugly you can be, God has set his love upon us and he will always love us. Praise God. That's something worth praising him for. And he only wants our good. I have gone from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation several times, and I am completely convinced that God is out for our good. He never wants to hurt us. He will not hurt us. He is out for our good. He is a good, good father. He loves us and he only wants our good and he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure so he can bring those good things to pass in our life. But now it's our turn. We need to love him back. We need to love him fully, completely with everything we got. We just need to love him. And by loving God, it gives him access into our life. Can I get an amen? amen. It's good that he loves us but we need to love him back. And oh, is he worthy of our love. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our allegiance. We need to love him back. Now, he's not um, needing love like if we don't love him, he's going to fall off the throne. But he desires our love, and we need to love him. And we should love him. And I know I'm looking at a group of people today that love him very, very much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me, uh, let's do this. Let's go to Galatians 3. I want to show you a little something here. I want to take just a, a quick side journey. It's, it's important though. Galatians 3.29. It's the last verse in Galatians, uh, last verse in the chapter, the third chapter. So Galatians 3.29.
Well, you guys are right on it today. You guys are fast. All right. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is such an important verse of Scripture for us in the New Testament. How many here belong to Jesus? If you belong to Jesus, then you are the seed of Abraham. And as the seed of Abraham, you are heirs according to the promise. You and I have inherited the same promises that was given to Abraham. Hmm. Say this with me. Say, a promise to Abraham Abraham. is a promise to me. me. Wow. All right, now, keeping that in mind, go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse number 1, God begins to speak to Abraham and and, uh, make covenant with him. Genesis 17 and 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now look at verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. So verse 7, we know from Galatians 3.29 that we're the seed of Abraham. When God spoke this, Genesis uh, Genesis 17.7, when God spoke this to Abraham, he saw your face. He saw my face. He saw every born again child of God. And so he was talking to Abraham, uh, Abraham about us. And so God promised Abraham that he would establish the covenant in our life And that he would be a God unto us. I don't think God's going to lie to Abraham. I don't think he's going to lie to anybody. But he's not going to lie to his covenant friend Abraham. So this verse is talking about you and I. And God is going to establish his covenant with us. And he's going to be our God. That's a, a powerful phrase. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. When God says, I'm going to be your God, what he's saying is, I'm going to be everything you need me to be. You need healing, I'm going to be your healer. You need peace, I'm your peacemaker. You need joy, I've got plenty of it. Whatever you need, I am your God, I am your all-sufficiency, I am everything you could want and more. Man, I got Holy Ghost bumps just all over you saying that. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. (laughs) Woo! Say it again. Say, a promise to Abraham is a promise to me. No, actually, I'm good. <laughs> I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's go to John 14. So covenant is, as we've said, a two-way street. It's a relationship. That's what it's all about. It's, it's a, a love relationship. It's, it's a commitment of the highest degree. And God made covenant with us because he loves us. And we are now loving him back. And boy, do we love him. John 14. John 14, 21. Are you, are you ready for your love to increase today for him? Huh? To come on up a little bit higher? Thank you, Jesus. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them... He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, 
and my father will love him and will uh, come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. There's so many wonderful truths in this passage here, and one of the things that we can see is this, is that there is an inseparable connection between love and obedience. I'm going to say that again. There is an inseparable connection between love and obedience. Can you see that in that passage? Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my words. You're going to obey me. You're going to do what I'm telling you to do. So what a connection there. It's an inseparable connection between love and obedience. Let me, let me give it to you a little bit simpler. We can say it like this. Love is the root. Obedience is the fruit. Love is the root. Obedience is the fruit. How many of you have ever heard the term lip service? Lip service. What does lip service mean? mean it means that you're, you say one thing, but you do something else. When you say it, your heart's really not in it. And, and God knows when people say, I love you, he knows that they mean it or not. And he knows the depth of, of how much they mean it. Right? I was thinking today, there's, there's many times I've, I've said to, to my wife, I've said, I love you more than you will ever know. You cannot say that to God. You cannot say to him, I love you more than you will ever know. <laughs> no, you can't do that. He, he knows exactly how much we love him. And that love is reflected by our obedience. And the stronger our love is, then of course the more we're going to obey him. Now, Jesus makes this statement. He says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And then he said in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. What does it mean to keep his words? Let me give you a list of what it means to keep his words. To keep his words means to have them sounding in our ears. To have them sounding in our ears. In other words, you are physically listening to the word of God. You're having his words. You're sounding his words in your ear. Okay? To keep his word is to have them sounding in our ears. It means to keep them before our eyes. We have them sounding in our ears. We're keeping them before our eyes. It means having them in our mouth. Sounding in our ears, keeping them before our eyes, having them in our mouth, and then placed deep in our heart placed deep in our heart with the result of doing them. To keep his word is to have them sounding in our ears, keeping them before our eyes, having them in our mouth, placed deep in our heart with the result of doing them. That is keeping his word. And you know, if you cut out any of those first four, it's going to be very difficult to do the fifth one, which is to to actually be a doer of the word. Because you're going to to wind up slipping. If you don't have them in your ears and in your eyes and in your mouth and in your heart, you're not going to have the ability to be a doer. So it's this whole five, five deal thing here is what it means to keep his word. I believe that there are rich returns to the man who loves God. There are rich returns to the man who loves God. And one of those is that God will come and manifest himself in our presence. I know that you would agree with this, that there is nothing like the presence of the Lord. There's something so special that it's hard for us to put our words around the, the preciousness of his presence and the beauty of it. There is, there's that unexplainable part of his presence. How can you define it? I mean, it, you can, every superlative that you can think of, and yet it still doesn't match. 
So one of the rich returns is that the Lord is going to manifest his presence in our life. Man, that, is, that, that gets me going. Hallelujah. The more you love him, the more you're going to experience him. Uh, that's just a fact. Jesus said, we'll come, we'll make our abode. And we talked last week about God's not coming to, make, to give a visitation, but to make habitation. God being at home in your home. You come into your living room and there's God sitting there on the couch with his, his foot on the ottoman. Hey, what's up? What's up? You are and I'm down on the, on the ground in a puddle <laughs> worshiping you. Hallelujah. His presence. God manifesting himself in our midst. The more we love him, the more we're going to experience him. I believe that truly loving God reveals a true Christian. Truly loving God reveals a true Christian. <laughs> How many of you know it, no, it takes one to know one? <laughs> if you love God and somebody else loves God, you may be across the room at a restaurant, but you're going to look and go, ah, there's a God lover. There's a God lover right there. It takes one to know one. And the more passionate you are about loving him and the more passionate your friends are about loving him, Man, that's just a great setup. It just, you it takes one to know one. And this is what it means to be a true Christian, is that you truly, deeply love the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Thank you for that, amen. Matthew 22, please. Am I going too fast, or am I doing all right? Doing all right. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and 37. So a lawyer came to Jesus and tempting him, asked him, uh, which is the great commandment in the law. Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. If we really looked at that verse, thought about it, we would have to come to the conclusion if we kept this first commandment, everything else is going to be pretty good. If we would just love God with every part of our being, right? Amen. We ought to love Him, to set our affections upon Him, and to take delight in Him. This is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. He said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind putting our affections upon him, putting our attention upon him. Uh, another place Jesus talked about with all your strength, all of your physical abilities, your loving God, spirit, soul, and body, loving him, delighting in him, rejoicing in him. Now, there is something special about this verse. I want you to notice the wording here. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord... Thy God. A big key to loving God as you should is right here. I want you to listen to me carefully. A big key to loving God as we should is to love Him as your own. To love Him as your own. In order for your love to be really where it should be with God, you need to love Him as your own. Let me, let me explain that a little bit. I've been uh, singing to the Lord lately over the last few months, and one of the things I like to sing to Him is a song I made up. And some of the, the words to it is, uh, You belong to me, and I belong to you. And He does belong to me. All that He is and all that He has belongs to me. So I love Him as my own. He's not just this wonderful God. He is my own. In order for me to love my wife the way I'm supposed to, I need to love her as my own. Right? And I believe Corinthians backs that up. So if you feel like your love for him needs to grow, it needs to come up, begin to think about loving him as your own, that he belongs to you and you belong to him. It's not just a one-way street where you belong to him. He belongs to you. 
And I know when I sing to him and, and minister to him about him being mine, that he belongs to me, all that he is, all that he has, I can, I can feel in my heart that he's pleased with that, that he's up there smiling, just being blessed and ministered to, because in covenant, he is mine. He gave himself to me. He gave himself to you completely through covenant by the blood of Jesus. He wants to give us all he is and all that he has. And so for us to minister to him and sing to him, you belong to me. Love the Lord thy God. Not just love the Lord everybody else's God. No, make it personal. He's your God. Amen? Amen. We're here in Matthew 22. Go back to Matthew 6, please. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, Lord. I just got a word for somebody. Little keys open up big doors. Little keys give access to big things. And somebody's going to listen to this CD, and the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you that this is a key for you is to love Him as your own. And it's going to lead to big things in your life. Matthew 6, 24 Jesus said, and you know, folks, this is the verse that got me started on this whole series. One day I was reading through my Bible and I came across this verse. And man, it was like the Holy Ghost just highlighted it and brought it in big letters to me. And I like er, went to a screeching halt. And this verse started this whole deal for me. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. Now, I had read that verse since I was a little kid. I could quote that verse. But that day, over a month ago, when I read that, it really stood out at me, and God began to deal with me about the simple fact that I cannot serve two masters. Neither can you. One of the reasons why you cannot serve two masters is because the masters, both of them, have different interests. And so you're going to get mixed signals. One master is going to tell you to do one thing. The other master is going to tell you to do something else. And so you cannot serve two masters. Even if you wanted to, you can't because they've got two different, um, two different agendas. They've got two different agendas. So no man can serve two masters. He says, you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold the one and despise the other. So you will love and hold or you will hate and despise. Then he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. How many of you know what the word mammon means? It means money. You cannot serve God and money. Money is the biggest God that there is next to the true God. People serve money more than anything else. And so my whole life I've known that mammon means money. But as I did a study, I found out, and this is what God was dealing with me on, is that it means more than money than what I had typically, like, yeah, okay, you can't serve God in money. Okay, no big deal. Mammon is a, is a broader term. And I begin to see that mammon really means that something like, okay, I'll, I'll just use this Kleenex box as an example. We'll say that this is mammon, this is money. If I serve to get mammon, I'm serving to get money, when I get the money, it's going to produce satisfaction and God is saying you can't serve things that's going to satisfy your flesh you're going to have to sacrifice your flesh to serve me Amen. and let me satisfy you Amen. and then I got to think about all the scriptures where Jesus had take up your cross follow me no man's worthy of me if he puts his hand to the plow and looks back all of those scriptures began to come to me as I was reading this verse here, no man can serve two masters. Everybody in this room is searching for mammon. Not necessarily money, but we're searching for that thing that will bring ultimate satisfaction. And the only thing that can bring pers uh, ultimate satisfaction is not a thing, but a person. Jesus. Amen. Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So this is the verse, and it really began to stand out at me. Let's read it one more time. No man can serve two masters. He will hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
You cannot serve God in your flesh at the same time. Ask me how I know, because I've tried. <laughs> and it doesn't work. You cannot serve your flesh and its desires in God. You're going to have to hate one and love the other. You've got a choice to make. Serving two masters is contrary to the single eye. Serving two masters is contrary to the single eye. Jesus talked earlier about having one eye, the single eye, then your body will be full of light. All obedience begins... Well, let me, let me back up here. Serving two masters is contrary to the single eye. Uh, back in the olden days, let me use this chair here as an example. Let me show you why it's uh, impossible to serve two masters. So the master's sitting in the chair, and the servant's down there, and the servant has his eye on his master's hands. And when the master points, the servant goes. Well, if you're trying to serve two masters, you got a guy here, you got this guy here. One's pointing one way, and the other's pointing the other way. You, you can't have double vision. You have to have a single eye on the hand that you're going to obey. Amen. So when we're led by the Spirit, we're directed to go a certain way. We, we look at that. We're, we're looking for it. We get that that unction of the Holy Ghost, then we take off. That's the single eye. Having two masters is opposite of having a single eye. The spirit of this age of multitasking is so devilish. So devilish. All right. All obedience begins in the affections. All obedience begins in the affections. What you love is what you choose. So if you are struggling with obedience, it starts with your affections. Read with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We mentioned a moment ago about there are rich returns to the man who loves God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. You guys may have this one marked. But looking at it in the light of this series... First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine, verse nine, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for everybody. Mm. For those for them that love him. So this isn't for everybody. This is for those who love him. God has a spiritual layaway for those who love him. That's a good thought. God has a spiritual layaway. He has things in store for those who love him. Do you love him? Yes. Guess what? God has some things stored up for you. He's got some things with your name on them. And not all of them you have to wait till you get to heaven. If you read the rest of the chapter, the Holy Spirit reveals those things to us and we can have some of those good things here in the here and now. But it's not for everybody. It's not for the, for the God-haters. It's not for the, those that are nonchalant. It's for those who love Him. Say rich returns. Okay. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 12. How would you like some meat today to take home with you? Something that will really help you. James 1, 12. 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Hmm. The crown of life is not for everybody. It's not. The crown of life is not for everybody. Enduring temptation is the opposite of giving in to temptation. Oh, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> Somebody was teasing me about that yesterday at the picnic. That's not an original, by the way. Enduring temptation is the opposite of giving in to temptation. <laughs> Knowing something is wrong is not enough to keep you from doing it. <laughs> Do we have any parents and grandparents in the house? Do we have any humans in the house? <laughs> All right. Knowing something is wrong is not enough to keep you from doing it. You can take someone who smokes cigarettes and show them pictures of black lungs and what, what that stuff does to you and how many people have died because of, of cancer of the lungs due to smoking and they go, man, man, that is rough. Yeah, yeah. Hey, on the way home, I need to pick up a pack. Yeah. Right? You can take someone who is addicted to alcohol, give them all the statistics about driving drunk and all the people that have died and how bad it is for their liver and how many people have died because of their liver. and what the, Man, that, that's just terrible. Can we swing by and get me a cold one on the way home? Knowing something is wrong is not enough to keep you from doing it, Right? All right, when your flesh is screaming to do something, the only thing that is going to be powerful enough for you to resist that temptation is that you love something else more. When your flesh is screaming to you, screaming to do something. How many here's flesh has ever screamed at you besides mine? Everybody here. Our flesh screams at us to do things that we know is wrong. Now, there's a difference between your flesh and your body. Your body's not your problem, it's your flesh. Your flesh takes the legitimate needs of the body, rises up, puts pressure on it, and twists it and perverts it. Your body needs food. Flesh rises up, puts pressure on that, perverts it, and you get gluttony. Okay? Your body needs clothes. Flesh will rise up, put pressure on that legitimate area and say, you have to always wear the best clothes all the time. So flesh takes the, the legitimate needs of the body and perverts it. Your body's not your problem, it's your flesh. Jesus never said crucify your body, he said crucify your flesh. So your flesh is going to scream at you to do something. So at that point, temptation is here. You'll have to endure that temptation if you're going to receive the crown of life. How do we endure that temptation? How do we endure that pressure? By loving Him. The only thing that's going to be, to be powerful enough for you to resist that temptation is that you love something else more. And that something else is that you love Him more. You've got to, you have to love God more than you love your flesh. You've got to love God more than yielding to the pressure. Oh, you know what I hear the Spirit of God saying? No man can serve two masters. Mm -hmm. So what's the key to enduring temptation and not yielding to it? Loving Him more than what your flesh is wanting. If you will love Him more, you won't give in to it, but you'll endure it when the temptation is over. And Temptation is only for a moment. It's not going to be like three hours later, you're still under the gun sweating bullets. It's passed by, by then. The Lord says, all right, you love me. You're going to get the crown of life. Amen. That's, that's a good reward. It's a good reward. So you want to please him more than you want the other. Don't answer out loud. Here's the question. What do you love the most? What do you love the most? 
There is great power in loving God. And I think that we have not emphasized and have taught on this about the importance of loving God and that there is great power in loving Him. I wish I was taught this as a kid. How many times have we gone to the altar and our wonderful Pentecostal church got on our hands and knees and cried and cried and begged and begged God for power to overcome when if I just loved Him, I would need to cry, I would need to fast, I would need to beg if I would just love Him more than I loved what my flesh was wanting. Pretty simple, isn't it? As opposed to all that other stuff. There is great power in loving God. So many of your decisions are based upon how much you love God. I'm convinced that the vast majority of your decisions are based upon how much you love Him. Some of your decisions are based upon how much God loves you, but the vast majority of them is going to be based upon how much you love the Lord. Anybody here ever been tempted to quit? Get discouraged and wanted to quit? How come we don't? Because we love Him. We love Him, and we know He loves us. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. Why? The bottom line is I love Him. I love Him, and he, He's worth more than that. He's better than that. Right? Hallelujah. Choosing Him is loving Him. Choosing Him is loving Him. That's a song I sing to the Lord. I'll sing to him, you know, that I choose you. I'm choosing you today. I choose you. You are my choice. I'm choosing you. And when you choose him, you love him. Loving him is choosing him. Either way you say that, it works. What we choose, what we love shows who we are and what we are. And if you love him, you're going to choose him over other people and over other things. What you love is what you choose. Our love for God can increase. It can come up and be stronger than ever before. And I want to show you how. I want to give you a story that you don't know about from my, from my life. And I want to share with you a story that happened to me and how God took that situation and taught me a valuable lesson. I was about 14, 15 years old. And... The church I was going to, the church I was raised in, uh, there were some guys who came into the church, and uh, we got to be buddies, got to be good friends, and spent a lot of time with them. And my folks thought, well, that's okay, you can hang around them because they're churchgoers. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time with these two guys. And uh, one day I found myself in a field of weeds, and all three of us were hunkered down real low. And we had a joint. They had brought a joint. And so they lit up that joint, and one smoked it, and another smoked it, and then they gave it to me, and it was my turn. So I had that little doobie in my hand, and we're all in this field making sure nobody can see us. Pot was illegal back then. <laughs> and so, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> So I did my thing, and they started laughing at us. They said, ah, oh, you didn't even inhale. And I said, yes, I did. I didn't even know what inhale meant. There's my wife going, he's so naive. <laughs> and I didn't inhale because I didn't know what inhale was. So I didn't get any buzz or anything at all. So I just puffed twice. and then, But I'm, I'm hunkered down, and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Now listen to me, this is, these are the thoughts that came to my mind. This is not who I am. This is not what I'm about. And this is not what I want to do with my life. I don't want to wind up a drug addict. What am I doing hiding in a field of weeds, smoking a doobie? And so, you know, I gave the joint back. So we left after they finished it, and that was during the week. And so then Sunday at church, hey, Phil, how's it going? Hey, really good, guys. How are you doing? Oh, we're great. I said, hey, after church, why don't you come over? I said, guys, I need to talk to you. Okay, what's up? 
Guys, I can't be your friends any. I can't be your friend anymore. What? Yeah, I can't be your friend anymore. I got to call a God of my life, and I can't be your friends, your friend, because I can't do the things that you want me to do. No, no, that's all right. Come on, you man. They put their arm around me. Oh, that's all right. Come on, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't. I said, no, I can't be a Christian and the minister God's called me to be and do the things that you guys are teaching me to do. And I remember it as clear as if it was yesterday. I remember turning my back and walking away from those two guys. And God taught me how to protect my love for him. If you hang around people who don't love God, it's going to affect you. Amen. You have to guard your hunger for him. You have to guard your love for him. If you want your love for God to grow, you need to spend time with people who love God. Amen. If you want your love for him to be passionate and strong, you need to spend time with people whose love for him is passionate and strong. It affects you when you spend time with people who have the name, they got the jersey, but they're not in the game. They got the label Christian, but they're not living the life. It will affect you. And I remember walking away from them, and I remember how good I felt in my heart that I chose the Lord over them. And I never got with them ever again. And within probably another month or so, they even left the church. Oh, how thankful, how thankful that I didn't get high. I didn't know what it meant to inhale. I'm thankful that I cut my ties. The Bible says in 1 John that you're going to either love the Father or you're going to love the world. And if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can't serve two masters. And I believe that because I made that choice, we're here today. And that, from that point on, I was far more selective about who I spent my time with. And I never spent time with people as my friends that did the things that they were involved in. Now, you guys know, and I've told you before, that as a kid, I always sat on the front row watching my pastor, taking notes. Well, when I was with those guys, I was sitting in the back. So that Sunday, when I told them I can't be your friends no more, and I turned around and walked away. I picked up my Bible and my notebook, and I went, and I sat back down on the front row, and I said to myself, this is where I belong. Amen. It's important to love him with all of your heart, Amen. with all of your soul, with all your mind, with all of your strength. And when you love him, he will love you back and manifest himself in your life. Amen. John 21, please. John 21. John 21. John 21, verse 15. We, we read this last week. Verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times. Peter got another chance to demonstrate his love for the master, didn't he? Now, I want to share with you about loving God and how to guard it and how to increase it. And the first one is your associations. You've got to be careful who you associate with. You need to spend time with people who love God and love the things of God. I want to give you another one that's revealed right here in this passage. So Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. And every time that Peter responded, Lord, I love you, 
Jesus responded back with, feed my sheep, right? Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Take care of my people. And I can, I can just hear the Lord asking, Peter, will you do it for me? Will you do it for me? I'm going back to heaven, and I can't stay, so Peter, will you do it for me? And he said, yes, Lord, I will. So even though Peter denied the Lord, God knew his heart and gave him a chance to demonstrate his love for him. That's the love of God. That's the grace of God. Even when we fail and mess up, God will give you another opportunity to come back around and prove to him that you really do love him. Amen? Amen. All right. Now look at this. This is, uh, this is a big key here. This is also wonderful. When you love God, you're going to want to write this down. When you love God, you love what he loves. When you love God, you love what he loves. You care about what is important to him. When you love God, you love what he loves. And you care about what is important to him. Isn't that true in a marriage relationship? My wife and I are unique individuals. We're, we're different in our likes. But because I love her, I do what she wants. I enjoy what she wants. And I care about what she cares about. And that proves to her that I love her. If we weren't together, I would probably never go camping. I would go hiking, but I would probably never ever go hiking, uh, camping. But because I love her and she enjoys it, I go with her. Because I know that's important to her. Amen. Right? And our last time we went camping was my best time. I was more comfortable, more relaxed. You know, and I didn't even get to sleep with her. Our granddaughter went, so I had to sleep in a tent by myself. <laughs> and I thought, here I am by myself, and I'm enjoying this. You know, I'm wanting to put my arm around my baby here. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm developing in this. But it's because I love her. And so I show her I love her because I'm interested in what she's interested in. Amen. Same thing with God. If you love him, you're going to love what he loves. Your interests are going to change, and you're going to care about what he cares about. In Hebrews chapter 10, please. We will stay with this and, and increase on this for a moment. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. That is so simple, but it's so profound. When you love him, you love what he loves. You're going to care about the things that are important to him. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. When you love God, you love Him everywhere you find Him, including His people. If you really love God, you're going to love Him everywhere you find Him. And one of the best places to find Him is He's with His people. I really struggle with people who say, I love God, but I'm not going to go to church. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Why? Because God is in the midst of his people. God is in the midst of his people. And the more of the people there are, more of his people, the more you can feel his presence. You brought Jesus in here with you today. Right? So if I want to find him, and I want to be in his presence because I love him, I'm going to go to his church where his people are at. I do not believe that you can really love God and not go to church. I just don't believe that. I've heard, I've heard, I've had guys tell me to my face, I worship God out on the golf course. <laughs> right, right. And the only time you say Jesus is when you miss the ball. <laughs> I worship him, really. You worship, yeah, I have my own religion and I love God, but I love him out on the golf course. I don't need to go to church where those hypocrites are. Well, you go to Walmart where the hypocrites are. You get gas at the gas station with the hypocrites. You might as well go to church with the hypocrites. There's hypocrites on the golf course. 
They're everywhere. Right? And I can share this with you real quick. When they miss the ball. When they miss the ball. They're not saying Jesus. They're not saying Jesus. <laughs> All right. So when you love God, you're going to love him everywhere you find him, including his people. When you love God, you love what he loves and you hate what he hates. If you really love God, you're going to hate what he hates. What does he hate? He hates the devil. He hates sin. He hates sickness. He hates disease. He hates lack. He hates depression. All of the works of the enemy, God hates. We should hate those same things. That's why we emphasize healing in this church. That's why we emphasize prosperity in this church. That's why we emphasize faith and victory in this church. Because God hates those other things. If you love him, you're going to love what he loves and you're going to hate what he hates. Thank you for that one amen and two grunts. Hallelujah, that's good. <laughs> All right, let's take these scriptures, put them together. I want to make a comment to you. There is nothing more important going on on this planet than getting the gospel out. There is nothing more important happening on this planet than getting the gospel out. What we're doing here today is the heart of God. This is his plan. This is his purpose. This is his heart. It's for his people to come together to worship him and then to learn of his word so we can walk this life of faith out. There's nothing more important going on on this planet than getting the gospel out. Do you know the statistics are that on an average, more Christians spend money per month on entertainment than they do the gospel. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. When you spend more money on personal entertainment per month than you do in getting the gospel out, reveals where your heart's at. Amen. Thank you for your agreement. I appreciate that. Every one of us comes to junctures where we have the opportunity to go further with God or not. Everybody comes to junctures in their life. I've had several in my life. You've had them in your life. As long as we're here, before the trumpet blows, we're going to come to a crossroads. We're going to come to those junctures where we can go farther with God or we can stand still or back up. And at that moment of that crossroad, that juncture, what's going to determine... Our decision is do we love him or do we love ourselves? Do we love him or do we love people and things more than him? If you love him more, you'll make the right decision and then you'll keep going further in the things of God. Amen. Our last scripture for today is Matthew 13. Well, Brother Phil, I've messed up. I've had a lot of junctures in my life and have chosen the wrong things. Well, <clears throat> I say to you that Jesus gave Peter another chance. He'll give you another one too. If you've denied the last three times, if you made the, the wrong choice the last ten times, you get to go around again. He'll give you another chance because he's loving, he's kind, he's merciful. As long as you're breathing, there's hope. Amen. Right? As long as you're breathing, there's hope you've got a chance. Matthew chapter 13. Now, don't laugh at me when I say this to you, but these are some of my favorite verses. <laughs> you can laugh with me, all right? Just don't laugh at me. These, seriously, these verses have meant so much to me. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. 
This is what happens when you love God more than anything else. Right here. When you love God passionately, you love him more than anybody or anything else. This is what happens because God alone becomes your treasure. Have you sold everything to buy the field? Have you sacrificed all to get the pearl of great price? Jesus is that pearl of great price. When we are not excited about God and the things of God, it reveals that we're spiritually lazy. And what it reveals is that we've put too much of the world into us and not enough of the word into us. But if you really love God, you're going to sell out. You're going to go for the gold. You're going to go for the, the treasure. And you're going to do everything in your power to keep him in first place and to be obedient to him. Because you love him. And because when you get to heaven, folks, man, your mansion is going to be awesome. The streets of gold, the river of life. It's all going to be absolutely beyond what we could ask or think. But the greatest thing is when you get on your knees right before the throne and look almighty God in the face. No words can tell. He is our treasure. He is our prize. And to look him in the eye and him look you back and see those eyes of love looking at you, you're going to see, oh, man, it was worth it. It was worth giving up Star Trek and Planet of the Apes, <laughs> whatever else that you needed to give up because he's your treasure. Amen. You love him. Amen. Lift up your hands and say, Father, I love you. I love you and I worship you. You are my treasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us, for making covenant with us in the blood of Jesus. And now it's our turn to say, Father, we love you back. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we will never stop loving you. We will never stop praising you. And as long as we have breath, our love for you is going to increase more and more. It is our joy and our delight to be obedient to you. Because we love you. Oh, we long for the day that we can see you face to face. Hmm, what a treasure you are to us. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Every fiber of our being, we love you. We love you. We love you. We, never even, we don't even get tired of telling you how much we love you. You are our everything. Hallelujah. Covenant love. Covenant love. Him loving us and us loving him back makes this life rich. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this message today and being a part of the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.